think uh, that Rasta women are some of the most beautiful women in the world. And uh, stands out to me was the fact that uh, they were so stunningly beautiful without makeup. Uh, Rita Marley and the other sister were beautiful. They're, all, they're also beautiful, but Judy Moat stands out to me. Um, and I think Rasta women are so beautiful um, because there's such a confidence um, embracing their natural selves. So um, with Rasta women, um, you don't see them slicking down um, their edges, right? <music> Greetings, this is Body Culinary. And today, I wanted to share why I think uh, that Rasta women are some of the most beautiful women in the world. And um, I've encountered um, and seen some very beautiful women in my lifetime. Um, some that stand out when I traveled was uh, when I uh, went to Malaysia once and the women were so just stunningly beautiful um, and their aesthetic and their um, the overall aesthetic and also their carriage. Actually, I thought that many of the men there in Malaysia looked very beautiful in their physical features, like many of the women. Um, but now when I'm thinking beauty, what's coming across is definitely physical aesthetic, their physical aesthetic, and um, also their carriage. So um, the Rasta woman that comes to mind in particular is Judy Mowat. Judy Mowat was one of the um, the I threes that sang with um, uh, the three women that sang with Bob Marley. Um, the other one was Rita Marley, his wife. I can't think of the other one's name. I'll look it up. Or the other sister's name, or the other woman's name. Um, but um, she is so stunningly beautiful. So um, I'm thinking what comes to me to mind in my mind's eye as some of the pictures, <clears throat> and I include some um, that she took in the early years. So I think she was also, she's also um, a mom. But what stands out to me was the fact that um, they were so stunningly beautiful without makeup. Uh, Rita Marley and the other sister were beautiful. They're, all, they're also beautiful, but Judy Moat stands out to me. Um, and I think Rasta women are so beautiful um, because there's such a confidence um, embracing their natural selves. So um, with Rasta women, um, you don't see them slicking down um, their edges, right? And uh, the first Rasta woman that I enc uh, encountered was my cousin, um, Linda, when I was coming up. So uh, my paternal side of the family is from Barbados, the Adbijan. And um, actually, when I traveled to Barbados um, years ago, I traveled several times. That's where I first noticed a lot of people with locks. Uh, many years ago, I didn't have um, locks then. And um, in any event, a lot of them had locks. And then my grandma Lou and my great grandma Jean on my father's side, they both wore their natural hair. So those were examples I saw of women comfortable in their skin. Now, I wasn't around when they were younger. I don't know if they ever had wigs on when they were younger, but I always encountered them um, just comfortable just very comfortable in their um, skin. And my grandma over the years, I, fought, I saw her wear plaits and I also saw her wear her different cornrow styles. And I also saw her when in later years in her 90s wear um, a short fro. And um, her natural skin was very chocolate. She was a, a dark chocolate woman. And she was just very, um, she was so pleasant and beautiful. Now, Judy Moat comes to mind because um, she had um, simple head wraps, her head wrap on. Um, you know, I'll include some pictures, but there was such a, a confidence in these women um, in their style. Um, they didn't have everything um, hanging out. So it wasn't so much a quote unquote sexy, sexy, sexy as we see in the today in the days of Instagram. But there was um, a dignity in how they carried themselves. Um, I didn't see them although I'm aware that some of them are mothers, I didn't see them flocked around in terms of um, a whole lot of men around them, but I just had a, a it just had a carriage of, um, of dignity, of confidence, 
I guess that's the easiest way I can put it, but that confidence and the beauty, their skin glowed. That was the other thing. They look very, very healthy. They look so healthy. Today, I see in this age of, um, of makeup, and I'm not making it wrong at all. I can't make it wrong. Um, but there are so many of us um, women, um, black women, women in general, but speaking as a, a black chocolate um, African, Caribbean, Black American, you know, all those parts of my culture. Women, so many of us are wearing makeup to cover up um, acne scars. And I used to have quite a bit of um, acne and acne scars. And that was very, um, it felt very uncomfortable and painful um, as a woman. I felt very, very um, self-conscious. And for a time, um, I was tempted to wear makeup to cover it up. I had bought um, Proactive, I had bought all these different things. Um, there was a point where I was eating very healthy, um, but in addition to a lot of things I was eating healthy, um, as I got older I started to eat more health junk from the health food store, more processed health junk. And then from time to time, like chips, back in the days, oof, I used to love barbecue potato chips. Wow, it's been many years. I never thought I would get over that. Uh, but a lot of the makeovers, these extreme transformations, sometimes you can see um, women, some that may have had scarring or accidents in their face. You know, I think makeup can have um, and does um, have a purpose and adornment. And women, we like um, scents and fragrance, fragrances and to be very creative in our, in our homes, to make beautiful homes. and. Um, do our daughters and our sisters um, our hair you know those are things I know I'm definitely um, drawn to but I just saw them it wasn't like um, a cover-up of their natural beauty basically health they look very very um, healthy and I'm definitely a woman that has always for many years I've always looked to see First, old pictures of my mom and my grandma and what they looked like when they were coming up they didn't wear as much makeup um, unless you were an entertainer, you know, um, those old school big band women and, you know, if you looked at Billie Holiday and stuff like that. But if I looked at the pictures of my mom and my um, grandma on my mother's side, they didn't wear um, a bunch. They didn't wear so much uh, makeup. If anything, I did see one of my aunties wear a really beautiful beehive. So I really wanted to get that for um, my prom in junior high school. I wanted to somehow replicate that picture. So side note, um, we may not realize it, but how we're carrying ourselves when we doll ourselves up and beautify ourselves, young women are really looking at us because um, that was a style I wanted to emulate. And I did have an auntie, well, shout out to my auntie Joanne, um, who, get, who knew how to do, she could really rock some cornrows and she gave me some beautiful cornrows parted down the middle here with beads in it and I just felt so um, beautiful and I got to go outside and jump double dutch and shake the red and white beads in my hair <laughs> so thank you Auntie Joanne so but um, back to the Rasta women if you just look at pictures of Judy Mowat I and mean, maybe you can get um, what I'm saying but just stunningly beautiful without having to put layers and layers and layers and pounds of um, makeup on and uh, as young women, we all explore um, our, femini our femininity and the allure of playing with flowers and dresses and, you know, if we like things off the shoulder or the top. But the thing about the Rasta women, they didn't, um, they looked feminine, strong, but not like strong in retaliation to, um, uh, not strong in terms of uh, fighting. I don't know, how can I say it? Just a confidence, a confidence, but they didn't have to say um, so much. It just seemed very natural, you know? And it's, um, I find it very calming and relaxing to see women that, where well, you can see their real eyebrows and their, you know, their eyelashes and their lip color and you see um, health. Now, I will say, um, when I've delved in makeup before, one of the things that I do like and have enjoyed is mascara. And when I was a young girl before, I think before I even knew about mascara, I used to put, um, I think I used to put Vaseline and then later on years, uh, vitamin E or oil on my eyelashes. I don't know where I got that or castor oil. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody told me that castor oil grows your hair. So, oh, that's what it is. I heard the older woman say that. And my great grandmother on my mother's side uh, used a lot of castor oil. 
and both my great grandmothers had great um, skin and they didn't have all these different products but they were big on olive oil it was prayer oil it was solid oil and that was also the oil that went in their hair I didn't like the smell I couldn't appreciate it as a young girl but I could appreciate it later and they were big on castor oil and castor oil packs they made liniment which is some kind of mixture and salve that they would put if you had aches and pains they would make liniment <laughs> and it had it had mint and other oils in it um, and these different concoctions that's the southern side um, but anyway they use a lot of castor oil so I had started to put castor oil on my eyelashes and then even on my um, eyebrows and way back in the day when I was coming up when we started to beautify I think around the time of becoming a teenager we would take um, and use the castor oil um, you know for our little uh, baby hairs <laughs> you know and then when Michael Jackson came out we we're trying to mimic Michael Jackson but back in the days of baby hair some people use Vaseline and um, somehow I picked up on castor oil so I do have uh, long um, eyelashes so um, yeah I would just put castor on I felt that made them look more defined and I didn't have to wear makeup and I could also put that you know um, on my lips my mother didn't really allow me to wear um, makeup as a young girl even as a teenager even when I saw my cousins and stuff wearing um, nail polish my mother would not allow me to wear nail polish and looking back now she was correct um, because without putting things into a certain context I couldn't know that um, as a small girl you don't want to necessarily you don't want to garner the attention of um, older men so maybe she didn't articulate it as such now I can appreciate it um, and articulate that, that now to the young girls that are coming up but back to Judy Mowat is just the fact she looked just so stunningly beautiful in her own skin with her own eyebrows and um, it's like a relaxed beautiful. I feel like um, in, in this time, many of us are like spastic, um, panicked, um, extremely anxious around um, being validated um, by social media, comparing ourselves to our friends, um, to coworkers, to other women in our family. Many women feel like this, this anxiety or competition um, to be picked and that uh, desperation and that anxiety um, it's a it's a energy without sounding too esoteric um, a desperation sometimes the underlying tone of desperation I think that can actually leave many women open to being um, manipulated or misused or mishandled or make ourselves vulnerable to choosing people or men that we have not vetted um, properly all because we're not comfortable um, in our own skin so um, my cousin Linda who's the first woman that I saw that had was a Rasta had another co uh, cousin um, that was also Rasta also um, on the Bayesian side that she was legendary to me because I would hear the older folks talk about her and her long um, locks but anyway my cousin Linda they would you know some people would talk about Rastas back then it was not um, popular Rastas were seen as dirty Ross locks and um, when I saw my cousin Linda she's the first person I ever heard um, really talking about um, black people with a really deep sense of pride and talking about your brothers and sisters in South Africa so she had some kind of an English and Bayesian um, accent because she lived in England and um, I remember her having locks and putting her hair she would tie it up and after she would wash it she would um, oil it and she would just shake her locks out and I her hair smelled so clean and beautiful and that was the oil that she used to use called Blue Nile back in the day but I remember thinking like as a little girl I was like she's not dirty and I was like her hair smelled so I remember the scent right so interesting how we remember um, smells and scents. I remember my grandma Lou's coconut bread, distinct scent memory in my head. And I remember the oil, Blue, um, Blue Nile, because um, it smelled so clean and fresh. When I got older and when I saw um, the brothers on the streets in uh, Brooklyn and, and in New York with Blue Nile, I wanted to get that scent because I remember that scent. But I remember her distinctly shaking her hair and then it growing um, nice and long. And um, I don't. It was just very beautiful to me. She was also an artist. Um, my cousin Linda, she liked to do crafts. And way back in the day, 
she would make earrings and sell ear earrings. And she mentioned Marcus Garvey. I didn't know anything that she was talking about. She was the first person that told me about eating pork, which back then, whew, many years ago, I was eating pork fried rice from the Chinese restaurant. That's what I saw my mother. That was a treat <laughs> that my mother used to like to eat. You know, so she was like, if I put the pork fried rice in the sun, I would see worms come out of it. And um, I was thinking like, really? That was like, um, turn me off. But that was somebody, the first person I heard um, saying these kinds of things. And then also she, my cousin Linda and my Bayesian grandmother and my Bayesian side of my family was so pleasant. You know, um, all the different parts, aspects of our culture um, have different strengths. And so the Southern uh, black side of my um, family culturally um, do the dozens, you know, get, get hot on each other and, you know, go cracking jokes. The other side culture, I found that they were, um, I found that they were very much more relaxed and, um, and um, very sweet. I don't know if I want to say more feminine. Um, I don't know if it's more feminine, but a different flavor of femininity. But I can definitely say what was appealing was um, they were pleasant. It were ple just very, very, I don't know, just pleasant. <laughs> pleasant. I remember my cousin Linda when she was, um, she was the first one to put me onto tofu many years ago. She would get from the, the um, fruit stand and she would bring it home to make her little tofu patties. And my grandma Lou was just very welcoming, made, making space for her in the kitchen to make her stuff. And my grandma Lou always had um, a chuckle. And you know, she just was never, she didn't make a big deal out of it. She just welcomed her right into the kitchen and I got to taste it. And I was like, wow, that's pretty good. So after I saw my cousin Linda do it, I wasn't thinking of being vegan or vegetarian. I was just mimicking her. She said something about health. She told me that the pork fried rice, you know, could turn to worms and can have maggots in it. And so I just tried the tofu. I went to the store, got it, seasoned it, and tried to make it into a fry to make it into a patty, you know? So um, all that to say that um, our girls and the women around us mimic um, the habits. If they see us happy and smiling um, and sharing, most likely we're going to gravitate towards that. I had another grandmother on the other side. Um, she didn't seem as happy. And looking back, I can definitely put it into perspective. Both sides, I'm sure, had many um, challenges as black women in the Caribbean and also um, uh, in the States coming from the South. You know, I don't know what it's like to see um, crosses burned and um, the different things that they, they went through and being able to remember their great grandmas. My mom, my mom can remember my great grandma, which would be my great, great grandma, Bama Purdue. You know, so I draw, I pull on the strings um, from both sides. Um, I will say though, my great grandma on my Southern side used to do the African hair wraps. And I, I think it's interesting, like the string, she used to take black string and wrap it around um, her hair. And that's how she kept her hair. She would wear her hair wrapped up. Some people call that a gale today. So interesting in things in terms of black culture, whether we want to say Africa, the Caribbean, the Caribbean, um, black American culture, there are things um, in black culture that are a through line that is passed down. And then we also have um, different cultural nuances because not everything in black culture, not all of us are the same. We have many different nuances. Everybody prepares their rice differently. You know, now in my generation, I choose if I was going to eat rice, it would be black rice and it would be sprouted, you know, black rice. So I like to think that I'm adding on to that tradition. But Judy Mowat, I think, is such a, um, an example of a woman that was comfortable in her skin. Now, in these later years after um, Bob Marley died, I noticed that all of the um, sisters, Rita, uh, the sisters, the I3s, I can't think I can look up the other woman. Judy Mowat, it's on the tip of my tongue. Rita Marley and the other sister, um, I think all of them cut their locks. And I remember looking up to see like, why would they cut their locks? Now, this could be controversial, I'm just observing, right? Still, I consider myself a young woman and learning from these other women's examples. <clears throat> So coming up, as far as I know, Rastas don't cut their locks, and I've read about that. I'm not, I don't claim to be um, a Rasta. However, I do celebrate um, that aspect of black culture because it's something definitely that I was influenced um, by. 
And again, though I don't call myself a Rasta, um, the women are really appeal to me in terms of their carriage. In terms of the first women I saw practicing um, a type of type of um, independent economics in terms of um, crocheting, selling their crafts, um, starting their own businesses, you know, in a, in a sense, um, and celebrating their natural presence without having to straighten their hair or alter themselves. So that really made um, an impression on me. And those are the first women I really saw um, with visibly long hair that was very, very appealing. And I had even asked my father once, Daddy, could I get some locks? <laughs> and my father was Bajan. He said, if you ever put those dirty rice locks in your hair, you never get the penny from me. So needless to say, um, locks were not really held in esteem. And then also when I went to Barbados uh, as a young woman, I had another cousin named Johnette, and um, she was Rasta and she was so much fun <laughs> and really beautiful. Oh my gosh, um, she passed away. But um, she made the best idol stew I had ever tasted and I was so happy um, to meet her. And actually she would go back and forth to Venezuela um, to get things and um, to sell different kinds of products and things. So that was mind blowing to me as, um, as a young woman. I was so happy to have met this woman that was doing something so different than a regular nine to five. And then she had shared with me at one point, she used to live up in the hills with her um, Rasta man. So that was pretty adventurous. Um, it wasn't the same. Plus she was so pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, folks, let me know. Do you have you know any Bayesian folks or uh, some of those Caribbean folks that are just really sweet and pleasant? At least that's what I found with many Bayesian folks. So, um, Judy Moa, and I think the appeal with the Rasta women was the comf the comfortability in their own skin, and to see these women without having to tweeze their eyebrows and um, put mascara on, just really beautiful and comfortable in their own skin. And it's been many years, but I would say I really um, enjoy what I see when I look in the mirror and I appreciate myself. And in this age and time of this conversation around um, hypergamy and even conversations around hypogamy, right? Um, you can look those, those terms up, but one is, well, look the terms up. I don't wanna turn it to another conversation. Um, but there's so much to be said for comfortability and uh, with the hypergamy conversation, part of the leveling up, women uh, taking care of themselves more in order to um, attract men that um, are willing to um, take take care of them in more traditional um, roles. Women are being encouraged to beautify themselves, to lose weight, which is a positive thing, which is a very positive thing, us maintaining um, a healthy weight. Um, and of course, we come in all different shapes and sizes, but as someone that's worked in the health and fitness industry, um, the education is there for us to make the distinction between um, healthy weight, which doesn't necessarily mean skinny, but um, carrying a lot of extra adipose tissue or unhealthy fat around the midsection um, it is a red flag for diabetes or the comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and heart disease. So I think that's a very important um, distinction. Also, I didn't really see many overweight um, Rastas. Definitely didn't see um, many overweight Rasta um, men and definitely I didn't see overweight Rasta women um, coming up. Not to say there aren't any, but these are things that stood out to me. So, as someone with very fine Afro textured hair, uh, my hair has been natural from the time of birth, but um, returning to natural for about um, going on about 30 years so the hair always does something different so um, it's very fine afro um, textured hair it's not very dense so I found that when I was twisting it it's just starting to get some length it's even feeling right now which I knew like a haircut because the areas where I used to twist it a lot and I used to put beads and shells on it have become very um, weak so those are areas that made likely um, and are starting to break off so the hair is always doing something but my hair um, does not like to be handled or twisted much so I've embraced it braced these semi freeform locks so they've um, they're growing in flat because it's not um, because it's not dense and it's full I would love big congas um, but this is it so I'm in full acceptance of what I have it's not very dense um, in the back and although I'm not big I don't like the feeling of 
um, covering my hair I have started to put some of these caps that I've made on the hair because actually I have to say I do notice a difference um, where it feels I don't know if I want to say when they say retains moisture I'm always like yeah right but it does feel um, different not as worn um, or smoother um, when I do wear like a stretchy um, cap on it and um, yeah, so to preserve my hair, especially being I don't have products in my hair, I'm noticing at this point now, I'm, well, I'm noticing a lot of it is breaking off, like about here, because I'm someone that loves to wash, right? And it just feels really good to wash on my hair. But I gotta say, shout out to Yanni, the lockologist. She was correct with over washing the hair, because if you're gonna keep this hair for years, on your head when you're washing it and washing it and washing it you're stripping it so i've had to calm down you know on the washing and i'm also in a very hot um climate so i think for many of us maybe it's just you know making it look dressed up now that i have a little bit of length on it i can start to pull it into a pony uh you know a, a, a ponytail if you will and um, when i exercise i don't like the feeling of hair on my neck um, but just any kind of pulling hurts and again, I have very tender um, Soft hairline that doesn't like to be pulled. So anyway, what I like with the Rasta women is um, the what I will say now I call it radical self um, acceptance and I will say even radical more so now because there's just more pressure more pressure like this this it's like a race to be chosen so you can be secured into your future and um, I'm not in my 20s anymore, and I'm okay with it. And I think um, the relaxation, for us to be able to, re to relax um, is really important um, to beauty. I've heard one other um, woman mention this, um, which is Salkis Ray. Shout out to Salkis Ray, um, who has some gorgeous locks. So go some gorgeous locks. I would love locks, like, but I I'm full acceptance of this is, this is what I have, you know? And you can even see some of the areas that are really tender. These areas are going to break off. So it's constant, these constantly, constantly um, self acceptance. So um, I hadn't worn any earrings for some years. I had let earrings go for many years, although I had these piercings um, for many years. I haven't worn any makeup um, for many um, years. I'm in a space now where I'm open, maybe to perhaps um, definitely put in more castor oil on my. Um, eyelashes and maybe even some mascara um, and I did even experiment with some makeup but to be quite honest I don't really care for it because I like the feeling of my skin I'm breathing and that is each woman's um, choice to decide how she wants to beautify um, and express herself right when we wear clothes and fashion and we adorn ourselves the adornment and putting um, even washing and, and feeling clean and um, oiling your skin. I love to, to oil my skin, not because sometimes it needs it because I eat so many good fats, but it's just very comforting and soothing and it, um, it's self it's self care. So I'm definitely with the, um, the acceptance today. It's almost like radical self acceptance because there's so much pressure. If you're looking to the internet or looking for um, information, you got to really know how to take what resonates with you. And it doesn't mean you have to be against somebody's information, but to find what um, you feel comfortable and relaxed with. So I feel it's, it's a good thing to enjoy yourself and like what you see when you look in the mirror and um, not be so preoccupied with being um, chosen because I think that can many women we can drive ourselves crazy and I, I find it's very important for us to choose ourselves because even if somebody else chooses you and you don't choose yourself I think that has a whole lot of um, repercussions right because if we're always going to be anxious about um, someone cheating if they um, really care about you or you know because if it's coming from a place of insecurity so the radical self-acceptance is quite often looking in the mirror and I just maybe call it a meditation or a relaxation meditation um, looking at your physical presence yes that's not all of who we are but appreciating every piece of your eyebrows your eyelashes 
your teeth. I have an open bite. I was like my thumb when I was a little girl. Um, scars that you may have. I have one scar, you know, on my back, um, which is a memory of, you know, a tattoo I tried to have removed. But always, we're always doing so much um, to follow fashion. And I'll say even um, in Central America, I noticed that so many women, um, and just in general, I saw it in the States too, so many of us are getting um, tattoos and these things, we're going through a phase of life, we permanently mark um, our bodies. I would encourage women, I can definitely say just a nugget, I encourage young women to maybe perhaps get henna tattoos that will wash off with time and that are safe where you first of all don't have to expose yourself to a needle and when you're done with that phase of life, you don't you haven't permanently marked yourself you know some people mark up the whole front of their thigh or you see more mature women marking up the front of their thigh or putting the um, tattoos in very um, intimate places or very invisible um, places that you might not want that tattoo when as you go into another phase of life where it's not so important for everybody to see your um, your sensitive or sensual or sacred parts, if that makes sense. But to each woman, they're only all on the journey to find what works for us and what makes us feel comfortable. Um, but definitely there's something to be said for appreciate, really looking in the mirror and appreciating yourself. I think maybe that's mostly a woman thing. I don't think that's um, all men. But um, you know, whatever you have, um, just working with um, working with adorning and accepting what it is that you have. It is definitely, I don't know, it's like an active, I would just say an active relaxation meditation of appreciating of your life cycle instead of waiting in this life for somebody to ask you to dance. You dance with yourself and more likely you can um, attract something. And um, you know, we're not necessarily in control of other people choosing us and to be single is not a death sentence right that's also a time to focus on uh, on yourself and some of us you know as my godmother said to me which totally threw me for a loop when I was younger not all of us um, may get married and that can freak many people out but dealing with reality um, you know can the, a benefit can be that we can start to plan more um, realistically for um, our futures, what we're going to do when we're older. Many of us take um, our 20s and our 30s, you know, 20s you want to enjoy yourself, but take um, our 20s and 30s for granted. Sometimes put ourselves at risk um, to maybe destroy parts of our body or expose ourselves, expose ourselves to certain um, things and um, that can stay with us for a lifetime. So I think it's a good thing if I can say it to any of those um, women, young women that may be in their 20s or 30s, there may be some things to put on your radar because we won't always be in our 20s and 30s. And you want to be mobile and flexible and able to enjoy yourself um, into your mature years, um, have um, hobbies and interests that you're interested in, um, not totally trash and destroy your health, your motor skills, your brain, exposure, um, your genitals, or even your psyche um, to all types of things that can damage you physically, um, emotionally, and preserve your, your beauty and your energy and your vitality. Because um, they won't always be necessarily at the same levels and if we're not conscious uh, or when I say conscious, I mean being responsible and aware. We can squander a lot of that energy um, and a lot of that juice. Like a bank account, we can squander a lot of it and not have it um, for our more, more mature years when we're really going to need it. So this is Body Culinary really occur encouraging you to um, indulge in radical self-acceptance. There's nothing wrong with adorning yourself. Last thing I would say is to be aware and be careful of narratives. I think definitely we're in a time where there is a competition. There's a competition for your brain space. There's a competition for the allegiance of women, for the allegiance of women who will give their loyalty to political leaders, to um, snake oil salesmen, to so-called spiritual, so-called conscious leaders 
that want um, you to follow them or their um, allegiance to them for so-called protection, physical protection. But sometimes who's going to protect you from the protection? You know, so I encourage um, women to do the things that we need. I don't think it's so much a quote unquote, I don't know, sometimes it's all this masculine feminine, but just in terms of common sense, do the things to preserve your, preserve your health um, and your beauty and to, in a relaxed way, but in a responsible way, more so than anything, responsible way, take care of your health and your beauty and be careful not to squander it. People are competing to give you the narrative. They're competing to give you the narrative for what spirituality is, for what the afterlife is, for who God is, for who goddess is. Everyone is constantly, or these, there are, are companies, there are people, there are men, there are so-called leaders that in competition to have access to your genitals, to have access to your psyche, to have access to your um, your money and your spending, you know. So they're constantly writing narratives, whether that means you're, you know, uh, just a slave narrative. Um, so that's going to determine the whole outcome of your life. The texture of your hair is going to determine your life if you're accepted. Um, if you have to only go the traditional route of college, I'm all for every education. But there, in this time, there are other alternatives. You know, you can decide the narrative, but constantly also handing um, our narrative over to other um, people. Um, I think we actually also hand, and this is not a jab against them, but I think we hand it over to men in this thing of wanting to be led. So I think these are some things for us to examine, you know, and I get there's a, a space and a place for leadership, you know, but there's leadership qualities in men and in women and they're complementary, right? And everything is not going to necessarily be so ideal as it's laid out, you know, in all of these books and in religion. There's real, there's real life, real life situations, for example. Um, I think now we're becoming more comfortable in that we have many types of different blended families. And I think that's always been reality. If anything, I could say as a black woman in this time, it's, it's for us to be responsible for ourselves and perhaps we can relax. If we can relax into what we look like, relax into being responsible for taking um, care of ourselves, then we can make um, better, well-informed decisions about um, who we want to hook up with and so on. But all of that to say, just something to think about is other people controlling the narrative or the story um, of your life and how it goes and um, what you have the ability to do as a black woman and what that's going to look like for you or any woman. <laughs> so on that note, um, if you enjoyed the video, um, please give it a, a thumbs up. I would love to hear you contribute um, to the conversation. And um, conversations all welcome here, different perspectives, um, as long as we keep them um, respectable, because I don't have the only um, perspective on the planet. And I appreciate the different perspectives of other people and other um, human beings. So I welcome to hear um, different respectful, respectable, respectful um, conversations, even if they are, um, aren't the same as mine. I don't need them all to be the same as mine. I encourage you to take um, very, very good care of yourself. Preserve your beauty, your health, your vitality, your juice, so you have energy stored up for what you came to this planet um, to do. So create a great day. It's very um, early here and I do have chores. Create a good day uh, on purpose and I will see you in another video. Do check out the Sister Butterfly and Sister Monkey Learn to Eat Better puppet series. Um, I have do have two books, uh, Whole Living Foods in the Hood Part 1 with menus to fit your budget with all different types of budgets for shopping from five, 10, 15, $20, all the way to bulk shops. If you want to shop by the case at a produce wholesalers and ideas for um, different menus of different things you can make um, from those different shops. Cause I find that um, many folks looking to transition to upgrading their food may not know what to do with the whole fresh ingredients. So I'm a big love of whole fresh 
unprocessed foods, um, primarily pretty much plant foods. So I used, I'm a professional chef, used to eat all the other stuff. Um, you can add that stuff if you like, but I'm focusing on the plants. And then there's also um, natural beauty, no products, love your own, your own hair and skin is cruelty free and it's um, vegan. Not that you have to be, but that's what the, the offering is. And that's coming from somebody that used to have quite a bit of acne, acne um, scars. It took me years to figure out a very simple way um, to clear my skin. Like basically, what was I doing that was aggravating um, uh, my skin to stop the cycle, you know, of the, the breakouts. So all of those, um, both of those, as well as a cheat sheet, a cheat sheet for transitioning um, to eating whole, fresh, living, unprocessed foods, plant-based, you can find on um, body-culinary.com if you're interested in coaching around, um, you know, if you really want to move away from mindless eating and be much more aware, which is where um, whole living foods can be really huge in your toolbox, right? Um, to being very aware around your food where you don't have to diet, but you just have a heightened awareness around what you're preparing and as well as learning how to manipulate um, fresh whole living plant ingredients so that they're attractive and delicious and it's sustainable. Starting a garden and um, fitness training at home, you can hit me up at info at bodyculinary.com and I do coach people, you know, online and I have some other goodies coming. Um, your stomach is not a graveyard. The t-shirt is on the Etsy shop on Body Culinary as well as fruits and vegetables bring us together. And, um, oh, uh, <laughs> get your nutrition right and your body tight. Um, the Grandma Lou Coconut Grater and the Plant Milk Bags are also on the Etsy shop. All right, folks, see you soon. So everybody can grow something.